Virgin Most Powerful Radio, sharing the gospel with clarity and charity. And now, Virgin Most Powerful Radio is pleased to present Hands-On Apologetics with renowned Catholic author and apologist, Gary Machuda. Welcome, everybody. Hands-on apologetics. You have entered into Virgin Most Powerful's Apologetics Dojo, and I am your sensei and host, Gary Machuda. Welcome aboard. Ah, It's great to be with you, closing out a fantastic week in the dojo. We've had lots of great workouts, lots of great information, lots of great guests, and uh, we're going to finish out the week with a bang because, as you know, Sunday is All Saints Day. That means Saturday is All Saints Eve also known as All Hallows' Eve, also known as Halloween. And where are the roots of these kind of holidays? Well, you'd be surprised that actually it goes back into the Old Testament. Through the early church fathers, it was part of, uh, feast days are part of the Catholic DNA, so to speak. And so to show our con- this connection with uh, Scripture, the early church, the Catholic Church, and which is uh, you know, the same thing as the early church. And and All Saints Day, All Hallows' Eve, um, we're going to have our very good friend, Master Apologist, William Albrecht, come into the dojo on the other side of the break. And William's going to uh, knock down and uh, upload some really great info on the Catholic roots of feast days and specifically All Saints Day. Uh, and I guarantee you that you will learn something new during this program because uh, William's done a lot of homework in this area. After all, he is the purveyor of PatristicPillars.com, which you know uh, focuses on the early church. And so he's going to be coming up on the other side of the break. Also, as always, we do a Finding the Fallacy where we look at informal fallacy, except for Fridays where we switch things up and we look at propaganda techniques. And since it is a political season, election season here in America, uh, it's really important, these uh, propaganda techniques, to be aware of their use. Because once you're aware of their use, they're powerless to influence you. And man, propaganda is wall to wall now that elections are coming up. So today's propaganda technique is going to be the appeal to plain folks, which I think is probably one of the most humorous, if you think about it, uh, most humorous of all the propaganda techniques. Also, we meet an early church father. Today's early church father is St. Cyril of Jerusalem. So a very, very important early church father indeed. So uh, got a great show in line. Yeah, lots of great workouts here in the dojo. And... Uh, well, hey, why don't we begin, as we always do, by giving a shout-out, our hat tip, our yoo to all you watching live stream on Facebook, YouTube, and all the other platforms. And uh, thank you, Colin. Appreciate that. Also, Strove Tuesday. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Also, I want to welcome all of you listening on radio around the United States and also via podcast around the world, either through our handy-dandy phone app or our uh, flagship website, which is virginmostpowerfulradio.org. And, uh, yeah, remember that is Apologetic Central as far as uh, being able to take all the great information you get here on Hands-On Apologetics. Share with your friends. Tell people about the program. Also support Virgin Most Powerful Radio um, because uh, we appreciate it. And uh, one way to do that, of course, is through prayers. Another one's through financial contributions, if you're able. And finally, also, by just spreading the word. And if you haven't subscribed to Virgin Most Powerful Radio, please do. Smash that subscribe button. or And while you got the chance, uh, go to our show, or actually go under the Virgin Most Powerful Radio channel. You'll see that Hands-On Apologetics has its own dedicated channel. Smash the subscribe there, too, as well, because uh, that helps with visibility. It even helps in some ways with funding. And uh, so we really appreciate it. So thank you, everybody who has subscribed. Thank you in advance for those who are about to subscribe. And uh, 
Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Also, if you have a question for William, you can give us a call, 888-526-2151. It's 888-526-2151. Or if you want to send an email to the dojo, this is how you do it. The official dojo address, the official mailbox is questions at handsonapologetics.com. That goes straight to the Midwest Command Center into the dojo mail slot virtually in which I uh, do read and respond to your emails. And it's a lot of fun to hear from you, too. So even if, uh, you know, even if you don't have anything to share, it's it's cool if you could send me an email. Just say, hey, we're listening to you here, and just let me know where you're from. I That always uh, gives me a grin, you know, just being in contact with people all over the country, all over the world, in fact. All right, so uh, let's jump into our Finding the Fallacy for today. Like I said, it's a propaganda technique called the appeal to plain folks. Now, since we're being bombarded on social media, on television and radio and everything, you I guarantee you've seen this technique dozens of times in the last couple of weeks, if not longer. And the plain folks propaganda technique is basically an argument where one one in which the speaker presents himself or herself as the average Joe. A common person who can understand and empathize with the listener's concerns. And we see that a lot in political ads. Uh, Often you'll see candidates uh, who normally are dressed up in suits or uh, dress clothes, uh, dress down and you find them in blue jeans and uh, a plaid t-shirt chatting with People at a a local five and dime store out in some country uh, village or country town, you know, with ordinary farmers, people just, you know, ordinary Joes and and carousing with them and laughing. And and the whole idea is to present this image that uh, this candidate can relate to you. This candidate is one of you. This candidate is just like you. Right. And, of course, that makes the other candidates seem artificial and strange. Now, I mentioned I think this is one of the funniest of all the propaganda techniques. I always crack up when I see this because if you give it two seconds of thought, you realize how counterintuitive it is. You know, it, this is not somebody who's running for mayor of a small town. This is not something, you know, some uh, running for um, uh like a school board or something like that. This is, we're electing the leader of the free world, right? The leader of the United States. You don't want an ordinary average day, Joe. You don't want somebody who's just like anybody else. You want somebody exceptional, right? And so I love these plain uh, folks type uh, propaganda techniques because it's so counterintuitive it's like you don't want somebody like that. You want somebody who is exceptional, who succeeded, who has a track record. But as you can see, this propaganda technique is a way in which uh, they make a particular position or candidate appealing precisely because it seems to be, or he or her seems to be like everybody else. All right, enough of that. Let's jump to the early church father for today, who is St. Cyril of Jerusalem. He was born sometime around 315, died A.D. 386. The place and date of his birth is unknown, but Jerusalem, but we know it's in Jerusalem and sometime around 315 A.D. Those are usually the uh, dates, uh, speculative dates given. He was Bishop of Jerusalem. He was made such in 348 A.D., consecrated by the proper bishop, Achaicus, Ac- Metropolitan of Caesarea. But unfortunately, uh, Cacius was an Arian, and suspicions began to settle upon Cyril, as if he had made doctrinal concessions in order to obtain his appointment. Yet, he soon came into conflict with both the bishop and the Arians in defending the Nicene doctrine. Now, Cyril generally used or preferred a a term known as homoousius, as opposed to homoousius. Now, Homoousis means basically like substance, and homoousius is same substance. So the Arians uh, preferred uh, like substance because they didn't believe that the Son is equal to the Father. Well, the Orthodox uh, in Nicene Creed 
course, uh, defines as same substance. Well, at this time, the term was actually fairly general, and uh, it could be used in either sense of the word, just like Cyril does. So uh, he was one of those who understand the term in the orthodox sense, and the orthodox, uh, not orthodox enough for the orthodox party and not Arian enough for the Arians. So it's no wonder that his career was a stormy one and that he was expelled three times from his see. Uh, at least he enjoyed peace during his declining years, regaining his see in 378 AD, and after the death of the emperor Valens, he continued on in Jerusalem unmolested until the date of 386 AD. He's best known for his work on catechetical lectures. We do have other works from him. We have a letter to Constantius, a homily on John 5.5, 5, and some other shorter fragments. But the one genuine work that stands out is his catechetical lectures. The lectures are 24 in number. The first being a kind of introductory discourse, and the rest being numbered from 1 to 23. Of these, the first 18 are pre-baptismal discourses delivered to the Illuminati during Lent, and this Illuminati in the Christian sense, not in the secular sense, and the last five delivered to neophytes during Easter week, uh, uh, who are in the liturgical ceremonies of the three sacraments that in which they've received during Easter vigil. The lectures may have been delivered as early as 347 to 348, when Cyril was yet a simple priest, but most probably they were delivered in 350 AD, and by which time he had succeeded Maximus in the See of Jerusalem. Uh, it's perhaps noteworthy noting that the lectures were delivered orally, and they were taken down in shorthand. The form in which they come down to us then is that of a transcript made by someone in the audience. It's not Cyril's own manuscript. And that's our early church father for today, St. Cyril of Jerusalem. Coming up next, Master Apologist William Albrecht will be talking about Halloween. Stay tuned. Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. Male and female he created them. According to Pope St. John XXIII, it is not true that some human beings are by nature superior and others inferior. All human beings are equal in their natural dignity. May God help us to look upon everyone as a person created in his image and likeness and treat everyone the same without favoritism or prejudice. mom's gonna have a baby she is will it be a boy or will it be a girl we don't know yet but we heard the heartbeat and my dad said this is gonna be someone very special you mean like being a president or maybe a doctor well probably maybe like a singer or dancer i think Hello, my name is Mary Ann Koharski. I'm the director of Pro-Life Across America. We know that every baby is a miracle and has the potential to do great things. If you know someone who is pregnant or in need of alternatives or assistance or would like to support the work of Pro-Life Across America, please call 1-800-366-7773 or visit our website at prolifeacrossamerica.org. Pro-Life Across America is non-political and totally educational. Pro-Life Across America. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for your support here at Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Here's an easy way to do it. If you're going to sell or buy a house, call Real Estate for Life, 877-543-3871, because they're going to get you a Christ-centered agent to purchase your home or to sell your home. And at the close of escrow, a portion of his commission goes right back to Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Call 877-543-3871. Thank you so much for your support. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 
888-253-2151. Here's Gary. Hey, and welcome back, everybody. Hands on Apologetics. Well, All Saints Day is coming up, and that means that All Saints Eve is soon upon us. And as you know, All Saints Eve, in uh, you know colloquial terms, is Halloween. And uh, where does the Feast of All Saints come from? And uh, by, uh, you know, and of course, All Saints Eve. Well, to help us look at the biblical and patristic roots for this feast and other feasts, we have our good friend William Albrecht with us. William is a convert to the faith. He's an international speaker and debater, has participated in over 50 live and moderated debates. William runs an incredibly awesome website, which focuses on the early church fathers. It's called patristicpillars.com. And William, welcome back to the dojo. Okay, yeah, we're having trouble with uh, our connection. Uh, So, yeah, so by the way, folks, if you haven't jumped onto his site, uh, check out patristicpillars.com. It's a great website, lots of information, translations, articles, commentaries on the early church fathers. And as you know, we love the early church fathers. And also, you know, while we're waiting to get William back online, uh, I want to mention a project that both William and I are working on, and that's called the Apocrypha Apocalypse Project on YouTube, that we partner together and we're producing videos on the Old Testament canon and how to answer Protestant objections. And uh, it's just getting off the ground. In fact, William is uploading some Spanish language uh, portions of uh, Catholic defense of these books. So we're going to be both in English and Spanish. And to help us out, please check it out at ApocryphaApocalypse.com. Excuse me, Apocrypha Apocalypse on YouTube. And please subscribe, like, and do all that stuff. You can check out all the great stuff that uh, we've been putting up, and especially William's uh, contributions as well. And, William, I see you're, you're with us. How are you doing, my friend? I am doing great, Gary. It is uh, what a great pleasure to be with you and to be uh, oops, to, uh, a little bit of technical difficulties there. But <laughs> what, what, what a great pleasure it is to be able to be here with you and talk about um, – Uh, this great festival day that we're going to be celebrating very soon. Yes, absolutely. All Saints Day. And then, uh, of course, we have All Saints Eve or Halloween. And, uh, you know, that brings up a lot of objections from uh, Bible Christians because they have trouble seeing where in the Bible and where the early church was there this idea of having a special day of celebration for the Holy Ones. No doubt, Gary, and and really the the, the number one point that uh, that I think as as Catholics that we should be bringing up is the Bible is very clear that prayer for the dead is very efficacious. Indeed, um, if we look in the Book of Two Maccabees, we clearly see the proceedings of prayer for the dead, remembrance of the dead, and clearly we recognize if we look at Hebrews twelve one that the great cloud of witnesses surround us. In our everyday lives, so that that right there, right off the bat, Gary, we have the precedence for honoring, remembering, and praying for the dead, which we've got to remember is the groundwork and the foundation when it comes to celebrating what we call Halloween. Now, a lot of people tend to get lost, Gary, and it's a little bit disappointing. On Halloween, they think of it in the modern day kind of Western thinking of dressing up as a demon dressing up as Satan or dressing up as a monster, which really is kind of, as as I just said, a modern-day retake on that, because within the ancient faith, it was not what Halloween was meant to be. And if anything, rather than being turned off on that, Gary, I think what we need to begin doing is we need to recapture what is what was and what is part of Catholicism, a proper understanding of Halloween a proper reverence for what it means. And really, uh, people need to try to get out of that propaganda kind of mentality and realize this is an actual feast day of the church. Halloween is the evening before that very important festival day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I mean, the whole idea of festival days, you know, honoring saints, is that pagan or is it in the Bible? Gary, what a great question. And uh, talking about feast days and talking about festivals, 
It is very biblical. When we book, when we look, um, first off, number one, what do we mean by a holy day? Simple enough, we get it directly from the Bible, the Greek word hagias. So if you look in the book of Leviticus, you have the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, these are the appointed festivals of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed festivals. So the incredible thing about uh, about this, Gary, is from the very beginning, as early as the Old Testament, the solemnity of festivals was made honorable to the Lord. It was an honor to celebrate things holy to the Lord. I mean, in fact, if you look at... um. um in Matthew 26, 5, in Mark 14, 2, we read, um, in Matthew 26, it says, But they were saying, not during the festival, lest a riot occur among the people. In Mark 14, 2, the very same thing happens. We recognize that there is there are things that are occurring in the biblical era. And what are they? They are festivals, they are feast days that the early church was celebrating. So as early as Judaism, there are festivals that are celebrated we go into the new into the New Testament era, where the Christian church is then celebrating festivals as well. So from the very beginning, there were feast days that were being celebrated. Now I know people may be wondering, well, what what are you all? How are you all going to tie that in, connect that with Halloween? Don't worry, we will eventually get there. We're laying the groundwork to show that festivals, feast days, were very very common within the early church era. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, uh, it was uh, obligatory for the Jews. There would be uh, festivals which are celebrated. They're joyful. There were also penitential uh, uh, fast and things like that as well. So that's something I think a lot of people miss is that uh, Judaism was liturgical. And when Christianity comes on the scene, Jesus didn't uh, get rid of the liturgical aspect, did he? Colossians too. Actually, even before we get there, as we talked about, there were festivals being celebrated. By the time you get to the time of Paul, what does Paul say? Don't let anyone condemn you in the matters of food, drink, or observing feast days, new moons, or Sabbath. Paul is being very clear. Festivals that are being observed, clearly, what do they do? They give honor to our God. The very substance points towards our Lord. That is what makes a festival holy before the Lord, not merely the day in and of itself, but the very fact that, as you know, Gary, all festivals, all feast days point towards our Lord. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, there's a great uh, biblical groundwork for it. And so Christians, uh, Christianity, of course, is uh, Judaism fulfilled. So Obviously, these festivals have a higher fulfillment meaning. So it wouldn't be surprising then, William, that uh, Christians would have festivals as well. It wouldn't be surprising at all. And when we look at the, uh, what I always consider incredible, Gary, we look at the uh, the interpretation. Of, we read Colossians 2. We looked at a number of other passages. When we look at the interpretation of those from the early fathers, we get the very same image. Trust us, people that are following along. We're going to get to exactly what we're talking about. Halloween, remember, is the evening before we begin the celebration of honoring the dead and then honoring all souls. Origin of Alexandria, when Origin is looking at the passage we read a little while ago in Leviticus, what does he tell us? He tells us that this is hearkening to true doctrine, to true teaching. He is noting that participation of the feast days are a shadow of the future in the book of Leviticus. And indeed, if you look at Basil, Basil, and people may know who Basil the Great is, he's been dubbed Basil the Great. Uh, what does he say? He says, festival days are pleasant and holy to the Lord. Festival days are part of God's spiritual law. So the incredible thing that we note, Gary, all over is the early fathers are looking at these biblical passages that we're reading, they're noting Festival days are very important. They're holy. If you look at what Eusebius says, um, he's writing in his Proof of the Gospel, chapter 4, he says that feast days are holy days. They are mystically true. 
They point to what? To Christ our Savior. When Ambrose wrote on the death of his brother, he actually says festival days point towards the body of Christ, towards the faithful. Augustine, in his 196 letters, says he would defend festival days, saying that Paul is correct when Paul says that they form the character of the faithful. So what are we building up upon? We're building up upon the very foundation of the fact that from the beginning, in ancient Judaism, festival days were celebrated, and within ancient Christianity, festival days were celebrated as well. Now, eventually, we're going to get to the part of what is Halloween? Is, is, as we know, there's nothing demonic about the origins of Halloween. It is All Hallows Evening. Now, it is the evening before we begin the celebration of prayer and honor to the dead that are departed, that are now resting. Whereas, they, whereas we call them resting, Gary, they're also in the book of Luke. What are we told in Luke? That they are put in charge of many things. So even though they're at rest, they are able to intercede for us as well. So what, what incredible imagery we have within the Bible, and then that is then supplemented by the early fathers. I mean, I'm blown away by that, Gary. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, that's amazing to to see that. And so such early, too. I mean, these are early church fathers. Yeah. Yeah, they're, 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 they're at a very early period in time. And uh, the important thing that I'm noticing is that if you look at the Old Testament era, we, get, we then get to the New Testament era. It would seem to me that festivals and remembrance of the dead was as prevalent as the book of two Maccabees, which means there's precedence for that even beforehand. Because if you look at any ancient Jewish commentary or look at any Jewish um, scholars, they will note that honoring the dead, prayers to the dead, have been prevalent within their faith from the beginning. Yeah, 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 good point. Uh, absolutely. So uh, that brings us to um, honoring uh, martyrs, right? I mean, ultimately. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and what, 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 what I learned when, when doing this study on this issue, and by the way, I'm very, very happy that yet again we're having a show on, on the Catholic origins of Halloween. What you will learn when you begin looking at the origins of this of this is a number of the fathers called it a celebration of the birthdays of the dead. Now, why is that? Well, really simple. A number of these early fathers believed that when somebody passed away, when they died, that was actually their new birth into eternal and everlasting life, which is incredible. So we, we begin... I hear we'll the music. Out, no, hit pause. That's actually a, a great cliffhanger. We're chatting with William Albrecht, patristicpillars.com, about uh, All Saints Day and All Saints Eve. Stay tuned, folks. Help the Helpless, a Minnesota St. Paul nonprofit organization chaired by Father of Tear and volunteers, is humbly asking you for your kind support to help the poor and the handicapped children in India and Ecuador. Through financial support from the help of the helpless benefactors, the children are provided with clothing, food, education, shelter, and the teachings of the Catholic Church. The mission is to help children thrive and become self-sufficient young adults leading productive lives. We also provide aid to poor families in Ecuador with food baskets, medicines, medical assistance, and help with funeral needs for the deceased. The work in India is done by Father Antonio's organization, St. Mary's. In Ecuador, the work is being done by the Servant Sisters of the Home of Mother. You can call us at 877-762-762. 8857. To learn more, please visit our website, www.helpthehelpless.org. God bless you. If you shop on Amazon.com, there's an easy way to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Just visit smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center under the desired charity. 
Now, when you log into your Amazon account and purchase products, a portion of it will automatically go to support Virgin Most Powerful Radio at no cost to you. Thanks in advance for supporting CRC and VMPR, and may God richly bless you and your family. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. This is Jesse Romero. You're listening to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. We're chatting with William Albrecht about feast days. And actually, we just went through some of the biblical roots for feast days and some of the early church fathers. And William, yeah, great point you made right before the break is that the church celebrates the not when saints are born, in fact, it's funny how many early church fathers, we don't know when they were born, but when they died, and uh, specifically, they celebrated as birthdays. They, they sure did, Gary, and, and, and it really reminds me of, um, of, of a term that I've stolen from you, where you point out that, and I'm going to talk about Tertullian, that's why I'm talking about it. I remember one time doing a show with Gary, and Gary said, well, Tertullian is not a full-time church father. The guy was a part-time church father. So really, that, that, that term comes directly from you, Gary. And we're looking at what Tertullian says. Why is it very important? Well, Tertullian wrote in the 200s. And what is he telling us? Tertullian is describing the Mass being offered for the departed on their birthdays. And he's talking about it being offered in more than one location. He was an early writer writing from Carthage. And he's telling us that in the crown we offer sacrifices for the dead on their birthday anniversaries he then begins to note how their earthly death was merely a passing over into the eternal abode of heaven tertullian then says that the soul can benefit from the prayers and the eucharistic sacrifices one could find rest he says that they may share in the first resurrection and each year on the anniversary of their death the church offers sacrifices for them. So, Gary, right there in the early 200s, we now have festivals being offered when people have passed on after their death. And as the church has always done on fest days, festival, festival days, the, uh, the Eucharistic offering and the prayers for the departed. Yeah, wow. So, yeah, beginning... Uh first couple of decades of the 200s, you already have evidence of uh, liturgical Eucharistic celebrations, right? Sacrifices being offered for uh, for the saints. Uh, man, that is amazing. It really is incredible, Gary. So we're right now we're in, um, we're in North Africa with Tertullian in the early 200s, where their feast days are already being celebrated for the dead. For people that may be barely tuning in, what do we mean by Halloween? We mean All Hallows evening, the night before the festival that we that we have in the church to honor the departed, to pray for the dead, to pray for all souls. So if people ever tell you, well, I'm Catholic, I don't celebrate Halloween. You do. <laughs> you do. Halloween is merely the evening before we get to the feast days of All Saints Day and All Souls Day. And as early as the early church in the 200s, and in fact, right from the very beginning, honoring the dead, having festivals for those that have died is prevalent very early on. Indeed, we travel. Right now, we're in North Africa. But then we travel to a part of the world that many people thought was disconnected from the church, but it really wasn't. It was the Syriac church and the great St. Ephraim. He says that there was a custom to celebrate the passing over into eternal glory 30 days after the saint had died. In his testamentum, he wrote, go along with me in the Psalms and in your prayers and 
uh, constantly offer sacrifices for me. And then Ephraim then goes on to say, he realizes he's already old and he's about to die. He says, don't bury me with expensive perfumes. Cover me with the efficacious prayers of the faithful. So Gary, what better way to honor the departed than to having a festival, a feast day, where we honor their memory, we pray for them, and I think even more beautifully, Gary, as the church is taught from the very beginning, we're the body of Christ, we're connected to Christ the head, we can ask for their intercession as well. Because as St. Athanasius says in his letter to Marcellinus, he said, let us sing the song, psalms so that the holy men may pray with us. So not only do we pray asking for their intercession, we believe that we are part of the body of Christ and the communion of saints are not cut off from one another after death. Yeah, 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 beautifully put. So it's, uh, you know, we celebrate the, the saints who died, you know, so we honor their feast days, the anniversaries, like they said, uh, actually starting 30 days after their death. And also uh, the church counts on their prayers as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, beautifully put. And again, I, you know, it just strikes me how early these testimonies are. This is not, uh, well, as you know, William, uh, many Protestants will say, well, the church became Catholic around the time of Constantine or the fourth century. And that's when you get the Pope and all these Catholic doctrines. But look at these early church fathers, you know, when it comes down to the celebrating the feast of, uh, basically what becomes all saints day. Uh, that was already practiced and used. Gary, what a fantastic point. You're right. We've read about Tertullian, we've read about Origen, we've read about Ephraim that are talking about feast days for the departed. Now, people then wonder, why were there not major festivals for all the saints? Well, there were. But eventually it does take time to get there because you need to realize in the early era of the church, when Christianity was not even legal, it was not legalized to be able to gather in large groups as it would become later on. By the time we get to St. John Chrysostomos, he begins talking about a festival already taking place within the ancient church of his time period. So before we get to Chrysostom, we've got Tertullian and Ephraim talking about days that are given to honor the departed. But John Chrysostom writing in the 4th century, then begins to talk about a feast day, a festival for all of the saints, not just individual ones. In fact, if you read, he says that there is a feast for all the saints in the world who have been martyred. He, th he then says, uh, he doesn't confine it. Here's the incredible thing that we need to realize. He doesn't talk about a feast day for only saints that have died. He includes all of them, those that have been martyred and all of them in the whole world. So Gary, even though people may say, well, was this celebrated on October the 31st or November 1st? We grant you one thing, the date then became fixed at a later time. And we'll, we'll get there, we'll get to there eventually. But what is important, that the foundation of this festival day is present already in the early church. And that is what we can rest our head upon, that celebrating Halloween, which leads to All Saints Day and All Souls Day, is very, very pious. And it's not about dressing up as a witch, a goblin, or a demon. Rather, it's about giving all honor to God and his beautiful creation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well put. Yeah, so uh, so the, the roots are there, you know, the logic's there, the, the biblical text and patristic text are there. It's just a question of it becoming standardized then as to like a particular date in which we do these things. No doubt. In fact, um, if you look in early history, a number of people will note that uh, uh, scholars have noted that perhaps sometimes uh, it was celebrated in May, maybe in March, maybe in April. Maybe it varied depending what part of the world you were in. Eventually, that feast day would become fixed to November 1st and November 2nd, clearly noting that, Hall uh, that October 31st was the evening before we began celebrating, when we prepared 
to honor the memories of these incredible saints who are now in glory with our Lord and Savior. I mean, if you look at what Gregory of Nyssa says, he says that um, he's talking about Ephraim. Ephraim was a very important figure in the early church. And he says that St. Ephraim must be in heaven assisting at the divine altar and before the Prince of Life with the angels praising the Holy, Tr the most holy trinity. And then look at what he says, Gary. Remember us all and obtain for us the pardon of our sins. So if you look at, if you look at what these early fathers are saying, you arrive at a point in time in early church history where the festivals are not only for one singular figure, but for all of the saints. And that is what we're talking about. When we get to All Hallows Evening, Halloween, we're talking about festivals that lead to the celebration, the honor for all the saints and all the souls. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. You know, William, was it only uh, restricted to Christian martyrs? No, it wasn't. What a great question, Gary. So um, pe people, people at first thought, was this, is this only for martyrs? So if you look at what Chrysostom says, first he begins talking about all martyrs, but then he includes all those departed, all those saints with the martyrs. So we realize that perhaps at one time, the martyrs were the ones that were being primarily given that festival day. But later, as time would go by, later by the time we get to Chrysostom and then Ephraim, the festivals are for all of those that have departed in the faith, not only the martyrs. But we, we might add one thing. The massive emphasis probably would have been on the martyrs at first, because really the sad thing is um, the majority of Christians that were dying before we get to the middle of the fourth century were being martyred. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good point. So, um, of course, the honor, I mean, the emphasis would be on martyrs because pretty much <laughs> everybody was dying for the faith who uh, were true Christians. No doubt. And by the time we get to the four, to the 400s, Gary, mm -hmm. which many call the golden patristic era, we have St. Maximus of Turin. And in his 81st homily, he then notes that by that time, it was already affixed that feast days were there to honor all of the saints, not merely only the martyrs. In fact, he says prayers would be lifted up for the martyrs and the departed brothers and sisters of the faith. The incredible thing is, Gary, he calls the event a celebration. He gives no indication that it was a novelty at all. Very good. Well, here's the music, William. We're chatting with William Albrecht, PatristicPillars.com, about the roots of All Saints Day. Stay tuned, folks. More to come on the other side of the break. Welcome, Daniel. You're on the line. What's on your mind, brother? Hi, I just wanted to share a testimony about Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I had a buddy at work who, you know, he's a lukewarm Catholic guy, and I wanted him to start listening to the Terry and Jesse show, so I kept telling him to download the app, and he kept putting me off. So one day, I grabbed his phone, and I downloaded the app <laughs> for him. I went on vacation, and you know, I kept telling him to listen to it. He was kind of put me off. I came back from vacation. He comes to my cubicle, and he says to me, Hey, man, I've been listening to Terry and Jesse's show, and it's great. And it's uh, made a big impact in his life. The guy, he's going to weekly adoration a couple times a wow. week. He goes to the Mass in the morning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he's an uh, on-fire Catholic, and he promotes the Terry and Jesse show on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Daniel, what a testimony, and I want to encourage our listeners to get those cards by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, do what Daniel's doing. Go out and spread the faith by inviting people to listen to Virgin Most Powerful. Daniel, thanks for your testimony, brother. God love you. You're welcome.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Hands-On Apologetics with Gary Machuda. If you'd like to join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Here's Gary. And welcome back, everybody, to Hands-On Apologetics. We're chatting with William Albrecht about All Saints Day, All Saints Eve, otherwise known as Halloween, and also uh, All Souls Day. And, William, yeah, that's a great point because way back in 2nd Maccabees, you had prayers for the dead. Uh, and that was part of the early church all the way throughout. But since it was the age of martyrdom, you know, specific feast honoring the martyrs kind of took precedence. And it's only after, you know, into the 300s and 400s that eventually, you know, the, the, the feast began to also include all, uh, all those who die in Christ. Uh, definitely, Gary. Well, really, really great point that you make there because— you would then find later um, the majority of the festival days were honoring um, saints singularly that uh, died. And I mean, I've, I've got to be quite honest with you, as, as much of a sad situation, situation as it is, um, so many eventually began to be martyred and killed that it became impossible to have singular days for just one or just a few of them which made it all the more important to be able to have a day when you honored all of the departed, not only those that had been martyred, but those that had died and had fallen asleep in, in the faith. And in fact, by the time you get to, you arrive to the 500s, you've got the great Romanos the Melodist, who begins saying that there is already a universal feast day for all of the saints and martyrs of the world. And he says, everyone, here are the incredible words, um, they're mind-blowing, if you ask me, Gary. He says, everyone around the world would gather. Having gathered from every city and being our compatriots, they came out from all over the world and have taken us from the world and have made participants of us in the feast day. Then what does he say? Let us celebrate a sacred feast, for the things on earth have become heaven, the lights among the firmament, the martyrs, among the multitudes have shown upon the church and enlightened the whole world, that David might therefore say with us that your lightning has shown upon the earth, O, merci o most merciful one. But he's not only talking about the martyrs. He says that the blood of the martyrs was shed. We celebrate the martyrs, but he also then notes that we're also celebrating the saints that are with the Lord. O saints that follow you, O Lord, he begins to say, by the time we arrive here, Gary, all those that have been departed, it was a well-known tradition, a festival day, not only in Syria, not only in North Africa, but as Romano Zemelidis says, everywhere in the world. And what does universal mean? It means Catholic. So everywhere within Catholicism, we've already arrived at a period where they are celebrating the memory of all of the saints. And really... That, that really is what we mean. In fact, if you look at what St. Jerome says, he says, if the martyrs, if the apostles and the martyrs, while still in the body, can pray for others, how much more will they do so after their crowns, their victories, and the triumphs? Indeed, All Hallows Evening, Gary, is a celebration of their crown, their victory, and their triumph. And we should ask for their intercession, and we should pray for the suffering souls. Because we know one thing, Gary, as you know very well. We're part of the church militant here on earth. There's a church triumphant in heaven. We should ask for their intercession. And then we should pray for the church suffering, those souls that are in purgatory, undergoing purification. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's also the beautiful aspect of that these saints are being held up as exemplars, right, for us to follow, to give us courage during times of persecution, uh, So, and also to have confidence in their prayers. 
that uh, they will obtain the graces that we need. Gary, you're 100% correct. And I know one thing. I would have massively let down the audience if I didn't finally arrive to the period where we get to November 1st and 2nd, being the days that become fixed, all saints' days, and we finally arrive there in Odalo of Cluny, Writing in the 900s, we finally have a firm foundation of this celebration being given that particular date. So if anybody ever tells you, well, when on earth did it arrive to become fixated on this day? You can find it in Odlo of Cluny in the 900s. He was a Benedictine abbot, and he wanted the dead to receive their eternal rest and glory in Christ. Here's the incredible thing, Gary. People frequently, frequently will argue and say, well, um, Halloween is demonic. Halloween is giving glory to the devil and to the demons. Quite the contrary. Old Lou Clooney would have been horrified at the thought. Halloween is quite the opposite. Halloween is a celebration. It is the evening before we celebrate the conquering of evil, the stamping out of evil, because we are honoring the saints who received their crown, their eternal crown. They bought, they fought, and they wrestled with the forces of evil, and they are now in eternal glory. That is what it's about. it is about. If you look at what the great St. Peter Damien said, he noted that Odolo was having visions of suffering souls undergoing punishment. And he was very, very prompted and very inspired to set this festival day as an official one of the church. So quite the contrary, it, it does not give any glory to demons or to witches. Don't let modern day propaganda overtake what the great saints of the church wanted this day to represent. And it represents the powerful saints in glory with our Lord and Savior in heaven. Yeah, so you have uh, not only the establishment of All Saints Day, but you also have All Souls Day. And, you know, William, sadly, I think All Souls Day has become overshadowed. You know, uh, All Saints Day, too, and to some respect, but I think especially, um, you know, the concern for those, for the church in suffering. Yeah, there, there really is no doubt about that, um, uh, Gary. And, and we, we realize that this is a truth when, when people are confused at the kind of American-like propaganda that overcomes this incredible feasting. That is the one beauty that when we look to our brothers and sisters in Latin American cultures, as you know, they recognize the importance of these days. They don't look at these days as being days where evil and horrors are glorified. They look at these days as being the days where the destroy where Christ is the absolute destroyer of evil, and his powerful saints are the body of Christ that should be honored and should be venerated. I mean, indeed, the incredible thing, Gary, I know we won't have time to go through all of it, but the incredible thing, even dressing up as a saint, even dressing up has its origins within the Christian faith, within Catholicism. This idea that this originated um, as something demonic there's really no evidence of that, Gary. I want the audience to know one thing. The idea that this is a celebration of a pagan god, people will say, well, you know what? Um, if we look at ancient documentation, this date, these particular dates, um, they date back to pagan celebrations of evil, where there are pagan gods that are being given glory. I want to put the audience, um, the audience's mind to rest. I've done a ton of research on this. The evidence is not there. The idea of this day being given to celebrate anything evil, any demonic festivals, you don't find it until, at best, maybe the very late 16th century. And it doesn't even talk about a demonic festival there. So really, Gary, the idea of this being a demonic and an evil day that is a novelty. Interesting. Yeah, so uh, uh, 16th century. So did it come from like the Enlightenment 
as some sort of no popery history, or is it a Protestant reaction? It, it, Where did it come it, from? It, well, it, you know, really, really, not, it's not very clear. It really does seem to have come from the Enlightenment. It seems to have come from uh, a bit of a mixture of paganism in a certain region, as 17th century historian John Aubrey noted, a particular region uh, began to get a ton of pagans that began to celebrate certain events on really pretty much any day. You then have people within Protestantism no, look, looking at that, noticing in their particular region that this evil day is being celebrated by pagans, not recognizing that the Christian festival predated it by a whole lot, and then they kind of put that stamp of, oh. hey, this must be evil. Yeah, so they, they basically correlated the two and just thought, well, this must be Catholicism adopting some sort of pagan practice, and uh, and because, look, there are some local pagans who who celebrate this day as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and Gary, to be quite honest, today, pagans do celebrate um, Halloween in that kind of manner. They do do it to honor the demonic. They do do, do it to honor things that are evil. Now, does that mean that we should abandon our ancient festival by, because of that? On the contrary, even more so, we should celebrate it in a more fervent manner and ask for the intercession of those holy saints to ward off evil. On the contrary, we should be holding to this festival because it has its origins within the ancient Christian faith. It doesn't originate within paganism. In fact, even the giving out of candy, even the candy being given out, was originally given out within the Christian faith. It doesn't have it. none of this. The dressing up, the candy, the celebration on this on this particular day, none of it has its origins in paganism. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and that's so much. I mean, uh, talk about the popular imagination. You know, uh, it, it, it's kind of um, counterintuitive, I think, for a lot of uh, people, especially here in America where Halloween's become a huge cottage industry, uh, to realize this is really a twisting or perversion of a good and holy uh, Catholic practice. Definitely, Gary. In fact, the incredible thing, back when they would hand out candy, or at times some of them would hand out fruit, back when they would hand them out to people that would go door to door, they would do that because the person that would receive them would then offer up their prayers for the dead in return. This has always had a pious meaning behind it. And indeed, Gary, it has at its root and at its origin, a Catholic meaning. And by Catholic, we mean universally Christian meaning. Very good. Well, hey, William, thank you so much for coming back on the show. We appreciate it. Gary, I loved it. I had a great time. All right. That's William Albrecht, ladies and gentlemen. Go to patristicpillars.com. And, uh, man, yeah, great program, and I, I hope everybody takes the words to heart and reassert our Catholic identity here during All Hells Eve and All Saints Day. Hope everybody has a great weekend. Coming up next, the Terry and Jesse Show High Impact Tech, uh, Catholic Talk from Menu. Thank you so much for listening. God willing, we'll be back again Monday. Bye-bye. In the 1990s, I lived and worked in Hollywood. But when my wife Betty's mom took ill, we relocated to Orange County. And it was during this time in our lives that I converted to Catholicism. Once my eyes were open to the truth, I couldn't learn enough about the faith. But I had less free time than ever, especially with a long commute. That's when I discovered the real value of Catholic audio. Listening to cassette tapes transformed my daily commute into a miniature retreat and that's the beauty of Virgin Most Powerful Radio today. Since the podcasts are archived, you can listen anytime on our smartphone app. I know how listening to Catholic audio can bring you closer to Christ and His Church, so I encourage you to visit the App Store or go to vmpr.org and download the app today. It just might change your life. I'm Matthew Arnold for Virgin Most Powerful Radio.